Let's begin. <laughs> oh, hey there, scary story fanatics. Welcome back to Cleaving Thought from Bone with your host, Sociopathic. What am I doing? I'm searching for that radio station, the one that's extra spooky and so hard to find. Wait, you've never heard of it? Well, allow me to enlighten you. Tune those dials into the Terror Channel and prepare to hear the horror to come. You shouldn't listen to the future. I stood stock still as I gazed silently up at the dilapidated structure, reiterating the reasons to myself that I had come here in the first place. Those reasons being curiosity, rumor, boredom, even I wasn't entirely sure. I removed the backpack that had been flung over one shoulder from my back so as to retrieve a bottle of water. It had been a long hike to get here, and I felt the need to cleanse my empirical desire for thirst before continuing and discovering what lay in wait beyond. For years... The township claimed this building to be condemned, an abandoned factory or office of some sort that at one point, at least according to rumor, had been scheduled for demolition. Supposedly, scheduled destruction of the place was tossed to the wayside as reports of a rattlesnake den within demanded crews keep their distance for safety. Of course, there was another rumor that the place would never be demolished, that what lies within is far too valuable to destroy, and the snake rumor only created to keep miscreant teens from vandalizing the place or throwing the random keg party inside. As ridiculous as that rumor was and why, I prayed for it to be true, for I am definitely terrified of the former, snake. Most of the exterior glass had been broken by vandals long ago, the front door gone, either having rotted away or served as a trophy for some juvenile delinquents. The walk leading up to it had been completely reclaimed by the forest that surrounded the place. What was once nothing more than tiny weeds wiggling through cracks in the cement walkway were now great, full bushes and tall grass that had overtaken it entirely. Trampling through the flora, I approached the door. Although some light of the outside world did filter in, when contrasted against my ill-adjusted eyes, it may as well have been resolute in darkness. The front door not all that dissimilar from a yawning mouth waiting to swallow me whole. The air inside was so thick and old with must and aged mildew, but the taste nearly choked me. Looking around at all that was refuse, warped floorboards, old leaves that had filtered through the broken windows from the outside, I wondered how preposterous it was to think that this place still had working power, let alone abandoned mechanical devices to make use of it. Still, I was relieved to find no snakes, which, considering the township's story, lent credibility to the rumor that I was now chasing. Having invested most of my day in observing no immediate threat, I pressed onward towards the old storeroom near to the back, my current destination. Pushing on the door, it creaked and groaned in opposition to my desires and the room beyond was in just as much disarray and neglect. 
Nearly every visual element was abandoned looking and reclaimed by age as the rest of the structure. Something, though, did strike me as odd as I finished surveying the dark room, nearly devoid of windows, aside from that that resided up on the high walls. The object that now held my focus so tightly was a large, computer-like machine that looked very similar to Jeff Goldblum's mainframe in the movie The Fly. Honestly, the machine looked as antiquated as it did a bit out of place. However, its presence heavily indicated something else entirely. Substantiation. As I approached the thing, I could not help but marvel at it, not understanding much of the ways of its gauges and oddly labeled toggle switches. But two of the dials and one switch looked schematically familiar, one dial having numbers and percentages inscribed in its edges, like that of radio frequencies, only exceeding way beyond the normal range on both ends. The other knob indicated a series of numbers that I did not understand, but when combined to those next to it, revealed their function of date selection. The toggle switch was easy enough to figure out, and actually surprised me that it had even been labeled in such a way. Engravings above it spelled out the word ON, while the ones below it spelled OFF in quotation marks. This was the rumor told to be true, unbelieved by most, and up until that point, myself included. Having wasted enough time marveling and staring with anticipation, I reached out and flipped the on switch. Truth be told, I expected nothing to happen. Nothing indicated that this building was even still energized, yet despite the impediments of time, neglect, and rational understanding of how the world works, the machine buzzed to life anyway calculating some parameters with its various clicks and processing sounds before tapering off into an airy whine that reduced to the sounds of fans whirring. Excited, I remembered thinking that there was no way that this was what everyone said it was. A quantum computer. But this wasn't just any old quantum computer, not like the ones being developed today. Instead of making use of newfound quantum entanglement theories and applications, this thing was actually rumored to generate wormholes. Now, I'm no quantum theorist. In fact, I'm studying for a degree in psychology right now, but I'm fascinated with quantum theory and quantum mechanics, the weird physics that occur in the realm of the very small, and the theoretical applications of those newfound findings. Hell, in my spare time, I look up and watch Yale lectures on quantum theory. I admired this thing humming and droning in front of me, still completely taken aback that this thing did indeed have power running to it, seemingly unexplainable. But I was sure that there was some sort of battery-powered source contained within, or running from somewhere nearby, hidden and unknown to me. I played with the dials some more, and aside from the thing making a few more subsequent beeps and clicks as a result of me playing with things I did not understand, the thing did nothing. In the end, I could no more conclude this thing to be a quantum computer capable of generating wormholes, or even really computing, since there didn't seem to be a display or any means of knowing what was being processed. Looking at its sides, I had seen that something had been removed from its left, metal stumps sticking from the concrete where something should have been, likely another machine that worked alongside this one, maybe even a monitor of sorts. Sure, it was seemingly no space-age experimental computer, but it was odd and made no sense here, a discovery in itself. Satisfied with this, I sat down in an overturned, empty bucket that I had found nearby, 
and took myself a long, needed rest. The trek here had been a long one, and I was in no hurry to turn back. I pulled out a bottle of water and my cell phone. Taking a sip from the bottle, I looked to my phone for a signal so I could listen to some music off YouTube while I smoked some happy stuff. No luck yet. Next, I pulled a pocket transistor radio from my bag that I keep with me for small side jobs doing maintenance and construction for people, my main source of income. At first, the radio speaker whistled and squeaked as I rolled the knob, looking for anything to come in clear enough to listen to. And then, it happened. I heard someone talking as if it were an intermission of sorts, or talk radio block. Seeing as it was the only thing that came in clear enough to pass as listenable, I left it on, waiting for what I thought to be a commercial to end, as I rolled my joint. But, as I prepared my pinner, I kept hearing the man on the radio talking about body counts in Michigan, how Detroit was completely lost, and that troops were falling back. Again, just thinking this was some kind of comedy skit, I listened. But things got even stranger. He talked about how President Gregor was calling for martial law, how anyone found with Swiss propaganda would be tried for treason, and strangest of all, the skit, or commercial, did not end. This was a program, but none of this made any sense. And then my eyes looked to the mainframe I'd been fucking with, the one I was randomly pressing dials and buttons on and seen its lights flickering and could still hear the occasional clicks of its processors. I had left it on, and now I began to realize what in fact had happened. I knew enough about quantum physics to know that a wormhole big enough to pass a person or normal object through was supposed to be impossible to create. However, quantum physicists have revealed that quantum-sized wormholes, too small to see with the naked eye, exist and disappear all the time, all around us, naturally. This machine appeared to create some kind of bridge between this world and another. A bridge too small to see, but large enough and stable enough for radio signals to pass through. Curious and still a little uncertain in my conclusion, I stood upright from my bucket after setting down my weed and slowly advanced toward the machine, radio in hand. The man on the radio kept talking about militias in the South and radicals invading Montana, and before I could make it to the machine, only feet away, I was stopped, frozen by two phrases, small but carrying so much weight. Words like World War Three and July 22nd, 2093. This, this wasn't another world at all. This was our world. This was our future. At least, if what the man on the radio said was to be believed. I had to be sure. I quickly ran to the machine, radio still in hand, and once again began messing with the dials. As I did, the radio signal again screeched and crackled, as if I were turning the knob on the radio itself. Again, moments later, a few small turns in. The small transistor radio had found another strong signal, a different signal, yet on the same frequency. Now I was sure, and even though my test had been affirmed, I was too curious to not listen on, to not know exactly what strangeness would leap out at my mind once again, throwing me off balance with equal streams of confusion, awe, and implication. A decision. I would soon regret. What filled my ears next, resonating off the walls of that abandoned building inside that room, was nothing short of gut-wrenching and a total mindfuck. 
the program seemingly started off in the middle of a speech, one that described prizes if a certain task I could not see was performed. When the man explained what would happen if he'd gotten something wrong, there was silence followed by a large crowd booing mixed with a few cheers. Whatever I was listening to was surely some sort of television program, and thoughts of the missing machinery I had noted earlier came to mind. The man asked someone unknown the name of a landmark, one within a country I've never heard of and I'm pretty sure doesn't exist yet. I don't recall the exact pronunciation of the disembodied voice that provided the answer, but the next sound heard was a bunch of disappointed awes from a recorded crowd. The next thing I heard made me rush for that infernal machine to hear anything else than what followed. I once visited a park with my family as a child, and subsequently had a rare opportunity to see a bear attack a deer. Most people don't think deer make noises, but they do. They scream, in fact, like a baby dying. And combining that with the sounds of bones cracking, of connective tissue being torn from muscle, and the sound of blood splatter as flesh is torn from bone, and that high-pitched squeal that cannot be fully described is nothing less than a hymn of agony. Whatever that man's punishment was for getting that question wrong, I do not know, and I never want to know. Holding back my vomit, trying desperately to mentally scrub that sound from my ears, I frantically played with the knobs on that infernal machine one last time. I spun the dial for what felt like minutes, nothing but static or dead air interchanging as I twirled through the knobs. Soon, a seedy tone, low, but there, and then static. Not static from the absence of a signal, more like static in the underlying signal, and overwhelming stagnant sound of that dead air. It was as if there was nothing there, as if I had focused in on some distant time and day was nothing there to be heard. At this point, I had had enough and simply turned the machine off, the lights gone dark, and my small transistor radio having reverted back to the normative static, like there was no more signal to be found. I left that place with all I had taken with me, leaving nothing behind, but taking more back than what I had carried in. My mind was heavy with baggage and mental souvenirs. Had I really just experienced what I think I had? Was that really our future? Why was there nothing but dead air in the long distance of what is yet to come? That last question would be answered later, once I would gotten home, realizing the rest that I had brought with me, the baggage that was not cognitive in nature but viral instead. You see, since that day, I've been suffering a myriad of symptoms that even doctors can't explain away. And while I sit writing this, quarantined in the hospital, much of my body has been rendered useless by impotence and necrotic tissue. And I realized what may have happened to the people that used to work in that abandoned place. Why no one was ever questioned and why some things, a few very important things, were simply left behind, forgotten. I know now that radio signals and frequencies are not the only things able to pass through quantum Rosen bridges, but pathogens as well. I do not know our true fate whether or not all that was conveyed will truly come to pass. But I do know one thing with resolute clarity. You shouldn't listen to the future.
Well, looks like no matter how hard I try, I just can't seem to find it. <laughs> Maybe I spoke too soon. Time to turn that off. But, if you'd like to hear more tales drenched in fear and chills, make sure to stop back again next weekend. But until then, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you can tune in again next Saturday. <laughs> <laughs>